Melissa Penzera, and I'm the director of the Shirley Fiddeman Arts Center at Borough of Manhattan Community College. And we are really excited to be uh, working in par partnership with the Battery Park City Authority to present two side-by-side -side exhibitions uh, of works by artists uh, Ned Smythe and Mildred Howard. And we're standing here in front of a work by Ned Smythe, and we'll also see a work here on view by Mildred Howard. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about the context of public art in downtown Manhattan. Um, we normally see artworks throughout the city in plazas and parks and streets and sort of take that for granted, but actually um, there was very little public art per se uh, on view in the city up until the mid to late 60s. Prior to that it was really more state sanctioned uh, public monuments. But Mayor Lindsay and his administration uh, in the late 60s were really keen to use public art throughout the city in various locations, largely as a way of revitalizing many of the urban spaces. Unfortunately, by the mid-70s, New York entered a really severe fiscal crisis. And so many of the initiatives that the Lindsay administration took on um, had to uh, uh, be dropped because just fiscally they weren't able to continue with those projects. So a lot of private and nonprofit organizations came into being that took on the sort of stewardship of a lot of these projects and exhibitions. One of them is the Public Art Fund, which was established in 1977 by Doris Friedman, who had actually been a major figure in the Lindsay administration. Also, in 1971, Alana Heiss established the Institute for Art and Urban Resources, and that would eventually become what we now know as MoMA PS1. Um, she worked with artists to organize exhibitions in derelict spaces and um, areas in the city that were sort of lying fallow. And then, um, also, Creative Time was established in 1974, and Creative Time was responsible for helping organize many, many groundbreaking exhibitions and uh, installations by artists. And they're particularly well known for a series of exhibitions called Art on the Beach. And those exhibitions took place here uh, on this area, in this area, on this land, which we now know as Battery Park City, but which at the time was still just landfill. Um, all of the uh, excavation materials that came from the construction of the World Trade Center, as well as numerous other sites, was used to fill in these um, sort of decrepit piers which were no longer in use. And this whole entire area was constructed with landfill. But there was a lag between the time that the landfill uh, was put into place and construction on Battery Park City actually began. And in that time period, there were uh, numerous exhibitions and these art on the beach exhibitions took place here. One of, um, one of the really iconic installations that took place downtown during that time that also took place in this area was um, Wheatfield, a confrontation, a work by Agnes Dennis. It was created in 1982 and she actually grew, cultivated, and harvested a two-acre plot of wheat which grew right here with the New York City skyscrapers behind them. And part of her intent was to really um, compare the immense wealth of downtown Manhattan um, with this wild growing wheat which really represented the hunger and poverty that still existed in so many places. The reason we think art is so important, so valuable to have in our park and to have constantly changing with new art is because art gives us freedom. It gives us freedom to explore ideas that we think about and that we may not have answers to. Ned's work initially evolved out of minimalism, so the work was very spare and geometric. 
But by the mid 70s and into the 1980s, his work shifted. And um, as you can see here, it took on a lot of sort of patterning uh, and decorative elements. And in fact, he became a central figure in a movement which is now known as pattern and decoration. Um, you can see that he's created uh, a kind of architectural space here. And the arcades are somewhat reminiscent of Greek and Roman temples. I always wanted to make, even if it was an object on the wall made up of concrete two, two by fours leaning, making a wall, and then maybe a concrete arch, and then a distribution of pieces on the floor, it was more environmental. It kind of came as a kid in Piazza Navona eating an ice cream. Uh, and there's a Bernini fountain, and behind it, this amazing church with sculpture and architecture. Um, and that was daily life. So early on with the galleries, I was making environments. We're in this architectural space, but you can see behind me, this very long table is actually very reminiscent of the tables one sees in paintings of the Last Supper. But instead of having religious overtones, there are actually chess boards mounted in the table. So it becomes a place where people of the community can come and gather and people can um, engage in recreational activities um, and people can kind of hang out and enjoy the space. In the gallery, we have um, a pairing of Ned's most recent works, these photographic works and sculptural works, um, with these concrete two by fours, which are actually some of his very earliest works. And in the early 70s, Ned did a series of installations that were sort of these architectural spaces that he created using those two by fours. Um, so it's kind of wonderful to be able to present both that very early work and that most recent work together. The idea of environment took me into public art, but um, when I did this space, I really wanted it uh, from that early idea to be environmental. And walking through the windows, you really, you know, it, it becomes uh, experiential and environmental because you have to move through it. But I also wanted to incorporate not just one photograph, two photograph, three photographs on a large white wall, which is kind of gallery-like. The idea was to put the two by fours in between it uh, so that the heights of the two by four and the eight foot tall photographs uh, would all become an architectural installation. In this piece by Mildred Howard, the house doesn't have a complete roof. It also doesn't have complete walls, and it appears to float above ground. These uncertainties are by design. When Mildred asked to have the work of art here, she asked specifically to have it in view with one of its two doorways looking directly out to the Hudson River, Ellis Island, and the Statue of Liberty. The reason for that is because Mildred believes so much in this country her big and beautiful family did so much to help first their home in Galveston, Texas, and then the San Francisco Bay Area. Her work is known internationally, and yet at home, she still questions if the American dream is fulfilled for all Americans. When I was first uh, approached by Battery Park City Authority to install a work, uh, I thought about several of my houses, but this one is particularly appropriate for that site. You stand in the house and you see the Statue of Liberty. Now, my folks didn't come, from the sta didn't come through the Statue of Liberty. They were brought here and enslaved. So it's a whole different story. And although the Statue of Liberty means one thing for some, I'm not sure if it means that for all of us. 
and it's now ch time to change the narrative. I think Aunt Mill is intensely focused on creating space. Um, and that idea that we can exist in multiple places. When I look at this piece and I think this is a reflection of a young girl from San Francisco who grew up in South Berkeley and now has a piece on home surrounded by high rises where people from different walks of life are crossing through it and looking at it and seeing it when they might otherwise not see her or her experience if she's just an average black woman walking through Berkeley, they might not recognize it. Um, and it makes me think about the power of art to create that bridge of understanding. Mildred's work, The House That Will Not Pass for Any Color Than Its Own, is a structure, a house, but there are gaps in the ceilings, gaps in the walls, and the walls and ceilings are made from this thick purple glass. When you look through, uh, it becomes a sort of filter that turns the world this beautiful shade of purple. So Mildred is asking a lot of very difficult questions of us. She's asking um, what, what a house is, what a shelter is. Um, she's talking about housing inequity. She's referring to gentrification. Um, and she's also talking about Americanness. You know, what, what are our basic civic rights as Americans, as humans? And that is very much echoed in the exhibition that she has on view at the Shirley Fiddeman Art Center uh, entitled In the Line of Fire, which um, presents a sequence of wooden figures also screened with the same image of a distant relative of Mildred's who fought in World War I. And she's asking us, you know, what is Americanness? What does it mean? And what did it mean for those soldiers to have fought for this country only to return home and be denied uh, equity and inclusion at every level? Every time I would walk into my space, I would, I would jump. I would jump. I could not. It was involuntary, you know? It was involuntary. And I would be like, before I got into the space, remember Mildred's In the Line of Fire is in the gallery. Don't be surprised. And I would walk into the gallery, turn the lights on, and jump <laughs> without fail. Um, her work for me has that power. There are so many elements in her work that resonate with me. And I feel this organic connection to it. You can go kill for us, but don't come back here expecting to get a good education or have fair housing or get a decent job or anything like that. So that's what inspired In the Line of Fire and the fact that perpetually African-American men in particular have had a target on their backs. In terms of Mildred's, uh, Mildred's uh, work and uh, the subjects that she chooses and everything, the content of her, of her work, it's always, I'm always impressed about how contemporary, how contemporary it is, how it speaks today, right? For example, this piece is like so apropos right now, this moment, right? It's so like on target because social justice is at the forefront of the conversation here today, not only in the United States, not only because of what happened with George Floyd's murder, but that's where we are. We're reckoning with this very hard thing that we have to reckon with, but we are at the moment where we cannot not reckon with it. But she's been blowing that horn. She's been like raising that flag for decades.